Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, we talked earlier about the EU's negotiating position on Brexit, and one party which will be paying careful attention to Theresa May's response is UKIP. But recently, its one MP, Douglas Carswell, left the party to sit as an independent, meaning that once again, UKIP has no representative in the House of Commons. And it heads into this election campaign after a turbulent few years. So let's remind ourselves. In 2014, UKIP won the European elections and their momentum continued during the last year of the coalition government. With Conservative MPs Douglas Carswell and Mark Reckless defecting to the party. But the 2015 election result was a mixed bag. Despite winning almost 4 million votes, the party returned only one MP. Nevertheless, the EU referendum was a high point for the party, the first major step in fulfilling its ultimate goal in politics. Years of tension between senior figures at the top of the party and several Nigel Farage resignations culminated in the election of Paul Nuttall as leader. With the Conservative government committed to Brexit, UKIP have been trying to carve out a role for itself in the post-referendum landscape. Mr Nuttall has had a long-standing ambition to supplant Labour in the North and earlier this week the party outlined an integration agenda centred around a ban on full-face veils. The party says it will decide at local level whether to stand against long-standing Brexit backers like Kate Hoey. But the polls haven't been particularly inspiring for Mr Nuttall this week. The party has only breached 10% in one poll out of five. Well, earlier today, Paul Nuttall set out his party's stall for the election on June the 8th. UKIP goes into this snap election determined to hold the government's feet to the fire on Brexit. We will act as the government's backbone in these negotiations. Indeed, if voters elect a UKIP MP, they can be sure it will be a true Brexiteer someone who has campaigned all their political lives for a free, democratic and independent Britain. And we're joined now by UKIP's deputy leader, Peter Whittle. Welcome back to The Daily Politics. Will you be standing in this election? Yes, I will. Yes. Where are you going to stand? Um, do you know, I'm actually not sure yet. Uh, I know Why is there to... so much prevarication? You're not sure, the leader Paul Nuttall's not sure. No, I mean, look, the whole thing has happened very fast. I think you grant us that. I do. So, uh, in fact, we know we have to sort of think quite clearly about where we stand and what we're going to do. So, or yes, where I'm... you might have a vague chance in actually winning. Well, the thing is, is that in the last election, as you said, we got four million votes from one mm. MP. And now you have none. And we were a bit scattergun in our approach, maybe, then. But that has changed. I mean, first of all, we've been organising on the ground much more over those past two years. We've got a much greater sense of where we're strong and where we're not. So we are going to be targeting much more in particular seats where we are strong. Right. So are you going to stand in London, do you think? Um, probably not. I think it'll be just maybe outside London, in the southeast. But I'm just weighing up a few things, I mean, at the moment. So um, we all are. But it, over this weekend, things will become much clearer. Right. What about South Thanet? where Nigel Farage tried last time? Um, I, no, I don't think I'll, it'll be there. But no? uh, you, know, you can press me as much as you like, but I'm, I'm basically just going to have a think about it and, uh, it... and uh, you know, make sure that we're absolutely right about where we're going to go. Yes, I mean, it is a bit strange. I mean, all right, you're standing... Really? You, well, hang on, you're standing, but you don't know uh, where yet. Suzanne Evans, another leading figure, isn't standing. Uh, well, Nigel Farage... No, I, she did a, she I, did I understand that. She did a great job of it last time, she's doing let, it again this time. Let me finish the question. Uh, Nigel Farage isn't standing, and, as I say, we still don't know from Paul Nuttall, who didn't seem to want to talk to journalists at all. It sounds a bit like you're scared of the electorate because you just don't think you have a chance of winning any seats. The electorate, the last people we're scared of. I mean, the thing is, is that you, you know, you, bless you in the media, you sort of try <laughs> to put the agenda all the time and put the kind of time... That's our job. That is your job. But, uh, no, look, it will become quite clear. I know Paul's making an announcement uh, this weekend too, so... Right, OK. I mean, since the referendum, UKIP have been at pains to identify themselves um, as more than a party yeah. of Brexit, yeah. that you have much more to offer. And yet you've agreed to stand aside in particular areas, so long as another party's candidates, mainly uh, Tories, uh, have a long-standing Brexiteer. Mm. I mean, doesn't that just show you you aren't really anything more than Brexit? No, not at all. I mean, first of all, 
right, we're going to be standing all over the country. Mm. When you talk about seats where we're actually going to be standing aside for whether it's Tory or Labour, it actually comes down to a very small amount. But the thing is that these are people who maybe have spent their whole lives doing what we've been doing in trying to get the proper, strong, complete Brexit. Right. So but beyond that, as I'm saying, that you obviously haven't got that much to offer, otherwise you would stand on your own ticket. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, when we talked about migration before, we were a one-issue party, supposedly. Before that, it was Europe. This week, obviously, people have been going, uh, kicking off about, uh, in the media, about what we said on Monday, about the burqa and about integration. I mean, of course, the thing is, what we're doing in UKIP is moving from a position of being purely maybe about Brexit at one point, yes, to a domestic party. Right. right? And so, therefore, what we said on Monday and indeed what you're going to see throughout the rest of the campaign are very strong announcements on all aspects of uh, policy in Britain and not just about the EU. But of course, this is to an extent the Brexit election. So uh, we have got to be absolutely certain that people get what they voted for last year. Right. I mean, Paul Nuttall said 350 candidates have been selected um, and the total number won't be too dissimilar from the 600 in 2015. Right, yes. Will it be closer to 350 or 600? I think probably you fall somewhere in the middle there, probably about, I, I, I'd say, certainly nearer to the 600 mark. Right. I mean, Is that because you haven't quite got the resources that you're not going to feel quite as many? I mean, where does the money for UKIP come no, from these days? A lot of, a lot of the... Uh, in terms of uh, our candidates, a lot of this is about the fact that Theresa May cynically uh, announced an election with six, you know, what, seven weeks or whatever, quite cynically putting the fortunes of the Tory party above anything else, which is something we never do, by the way, in, in UKIP. And so, therefore, obviously, it's been quite quick. We've had to do this quite quick. But uh, we are, you know, we're fine in terms of money. We are secure financially. Um, and so, you know, we're going to go forward and uh, I think it'll, uh, it'll be an exciting campaign. All right. I mean, you talked about the, the domestic policies. Well, let's talk about one of them, which is the ban on the burqa. Um, and as you know, uh, your main donor, or certainly he was your main donor, Aaron Banks, said it was like going to war on the Muslim religion. What well, he's wrong. To him? He's totally wrong. First of all, he's wrong uh, also on the actual saying this is about going to... We're not going to war on Muslims at all. This is an integration agenda, first of all. How is it about integration if you're telling women what to wear? The fact is, is that the full face covering, this is not the headscarf, this is not any other form, just the full face covering, right, is a literal ba uh, ba barrier to integration. It is something which has been banned in France, something which has been banned in Belgium. Indeed, the biggest... A uh, party in the European Parliament has just recommended that there should be an EU-wide ban on it. There is a growing public unease about this. And the fact is that also it's a real living symbol of female subjugation. And it's amazing that, you know, when it's actually put forward that this is something which, you know, you, we're telling women what to wear. Uh, in many Middle Eastern countries, there have been long-standing campaigns so that women are freed from this kind of restrictive... Right, but I mean... in liberal democracies is it put forward in that way. So why is it alienating key people in your own party? I mean, it wasn't just Aaron Banks. James Carver, uh, the member of the European Parliament, said he strongly disagreed. He said it was misguided, that no-one has the right to dictate what people should well, wear. And I feel this policy undermines my desire to represent all communities within the West Midlands, the area that he has represented. Does I, he not have a point? I don't, ag I don't agree with uh, Jim over that. And, and also, the fact is, we're not a whipped party, right? So we're, that's always been one of our strengths. You know, OK, it means people can speak out, whatever. When it comes to Aaron Banks, for example, and what Jim has said, the point is, is that the full face burqa, and for that matter, FGM, they are not in the Quran, they are not religious practices, they are cultural ones. Right, but you say it's not about Muslims, but it sounds all about Muslims. No, but in in the case, no, no, for example, FGM is not solely uh, an is. Uh, but the Burqa ban is. The fact is, is that when it comes to that, it is not actually something that is ordained by the Quran, and we are actually behind the curve uh, compared to many countries on this. Jenny Russell, despite the fact that there has been some uh, internal opposition to it, Paul Nuttall reiterated, restated the commitment to the Burqa ban. That policy says it came from the grassroots. Do you think it is a popular policy? For UKIP popular, supporters? Popular amongst UKIP supporters or, or amongst people they hope to attract? Well, both. Well, they're only at 7% in the polls. Um, I th I'm sure it will appeal to some people, but I think that UKIP's major problem is that it was about two things, a cause and a charismatic leader. They've lost their cause. That's been hijacked now by the Tories who are going for Brexit. And they've lost their charismatic leader. No, no, and I don't think... Points. I don't... I don't you have lost your charismatic leader, I'm afraid, if, you, if you're maintaining that no, no. Paul Nuttall's the same thing as Nigel Farage. And... 
basically, that's why they've sunk in the polls and that's why they're desperately trying to draw attention to themselves now. Right, you know, and if you look at some of the I polls... I must come back on this. When you say the type of people we're going to attract and all the kind of implications of that... No, the, well, what are the implications? No, no, I'm just you, talking about the kinds the, of people the burka, who, who a ban might on be the burka, interested in voting for you. A ban on the burqa is supported by voters of every single political party, including the Lib Dems, right, in this country. That is how far uh, public opinion has moved and how... What are the percentages for the support from those parties, then, for that? I think, it, it, obviously, in, my, in, in UKIP, it is it's huge. It's like 84%. Mm, well, I think well. with the, in the Tory party, it's about 60-something. And then you come down in the 40s to Labour, and then, obviously, much less in the Lib Dems. But the point is I mean, they I are don't... majorities. Right. Well, let's have a look at the polls. Um, yeah. Jenny has raised them. I mean, even the Lib Dems are now ahead of you. It does look as if this election is going to be where UKIP crashes and burns. No. No, 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 look... 7%. The Lib Dems are on 10%. Yes, I, I know, but look, we've got six weeks to go. I'm, I'm very... You know, I'm very touched by your, your, your face still in the polls after all the things that happened last year. Mm. Um, but we've actually... They still get most of the polls right over well... periods of time. It's true <laughs> they have had some key ones that have been yeah. wrong in the past. What do you think, well... though, as, as the sort of chances of success for UKIP? I mean, all right, let's put the polls aside for once. But looking realistically, um, Nigel Farage has gone. Uh, as we know, Paul Nuttall is the new leader. There had been a huge amount of turbulence. Um, Brexit, it seems, is happening. Um, and so, what is the point? I would dearly love to see one or two UKIP MEP, uh, M MPs rather, in, in Parliament, partly to hold the uh, Theresa May's feet to the fire, as, as they say, and partly to talk about issues that the Conservatives are not addressing at the moment, like, like social cohesion. Um, nevertheless, I do regretfully say that I don't think UKIP are going to win many, if any, seats. And I think that's, that's rather sad. But it's, it's unfortunately a function of the fact that Theresa May has, has um, nailed her cards to the marks. She is, she is Brexit. It means Brexit. And unfortunately, UKIP is still associated, like it or not, with, with leaving the European Union. So no, no, its no, job I, is done. I don't agree at all. all I think you'll be surprised. Um, I think, as I said, the big difference this time is that, you know, voter share is one thing, yes, and it probably won't be as high as it was last time. But the fact is, is that there are no prizes for coming second with the first past the post. And so, therefore, we do know that this time. And we have been much more focused on a number of seats. So I think that actually you could be surprised. What um, level do you think? I'm sorry? What, what about the number of seats? What level do you think you'll get then? It's hard to say at the moment, but I mean, the thing is, is that we had the one, but I th certainly think I would like to see, get us, uh, uh, we will be targeting maybe around about six particular places. All right. And, uh, and I think that therefore, you know, and also, of course, there are other, we've got a secondary layer of seats that we're going to go for too. So. Right. I mean, it, the, the, the reality, though, um, as John Curtis, the sophologist, said, is that the UKIP vote is going to the Tories. Do you accept that, that there is a shift? I mean, not only is there a shift in personnel going to the Tories, is, as we've seen, but there is also a shift uh, amongst voters, and that's the story of the first week of the campaign, he says. Well, it is only the first week of the campaign. I accept the, that. The, the personnel that have gone were always going to, you know, basically they're just, you know, they joined us and piggybacked on us for a while and gone back to where they should always have been. That is for sure. They're, they are not uh, missed at all. Um, but I think the thing is, what will become clear to people, it's already becoming clear, is that, for example, on a big issue like migration, where people absolutely do trust and believe that we say what we mean, right, there is nothing coming from the government. This will become quite clear. All right. that basically, immigration control, immigration levels will stay the same for about 10 years after, actually, we leave. That is going to become clear over the next six weeks. Peter Whittle, thank, thank you. you. UKIP's leader, Paul Nuttall, has launched the party's election campaign, describing it as the Brexit election. He claimed a big Conservative majority would allow Theresa May to backtrack on promises over Brexit, and he promised that UKIP would fight the election with vigour. Here's our political correspondent, Alex Forsyth. UKIP are a nasty racist party. Rarely far from controversy, even UKIP's campaign launch was disturbed by a protest staged by members of a socialist party. Someone who has campaigned. All the party the leader says his policies three, are radical, three, but not racist. And although Brexit is happening, UKIP still has a role. Minister, UKIP goes into this snap election determined to hold the government's feet to the fire on Brexit. We will act as the government's Backhold. At the last general election, UKIP was riding high. It was shaping the debate around immigration and the EU referendum. But this time, it's fighting to prove its relevance. In Thurrock and Essex, the party lost by just a few thousand votes last time round. 
Part industrial, in part deprived, most people here backed Brexit. So does UKIP still matter? I mean, they haven't put themselves about. Really, I don't know the name of the new leader. Well, at the end of the day, without UKIP, we wouldn't have had a Brexit. And you think they have a role in Brexit now? I think they have a major role. But this councillor has quit the party to join the Tories, saying after Brexit, UKIP lost its way. There was so much infighting. Um, we didn't look like we had a plan to adapt. The Tories coalesced together. He disagrees. Adamant UKIP's policies are about more than EU membership. We want to see cuts to immigration, as do the vast majority of British people. We'll be the only party going into this election with a clear commitment to slashing the foreign aid budget to ensure that British taxpayers' money is spent on the NHS. Uh, we'll be a party going into this election with commitments uh, to raise defence spending and indeed to have more police officers out there on the street as well. UKIP's agreed not to stand against some other party candidates if they're committed to Brexit. But he says they will be fighting far and wide to add a radical voice to the national debate. Alex Forsyth, BBC News. Well, UKIP formally launched this general election campaign today, promising to be the backbone of Brexit and making sure that Britain fully left the European Union. UKIP's leader, Paul Nuttall, also confirmed that he would stand for Parliament, but he won't say where until tomorrow. Our political correspondent, Michael Crick, has this. It looks like the northeast port of Hartlepool will be the seat that Paul Nuttall will be fighting at this election. How symbolic the constituency which once had arch-European Peter Mandelson as its MP. Women are allowed to wear what they like. But at a hotel in London this morning, the launch of UKIP's national campaign was delayed by the ejection of these protesters. UKIP are a nasty racist party. They spread racism and division and hatred. The event was strikingly low-key, with only one of UKIP's 20 Euro MPs there to hear Paul Nuttall, the only speaker, say this is a Brexit election. We also believe that a whopping Conservative majority will only serve to put Brexit in peril. Hordes of Tory lobby, lobby fodder will allow the Prime Minister to backslide safe in the knowledge that she has the votes banked. But Nuttall wouldn't say which seat he'll fight only two months after UKIP put huge effort into his failed by-election campaign in Stoke-on-Trent. Only a couple of months ago, you were telling us how your heart was in Stoke-on-Trent, you were committed to Stoke-on-Trent, you were going to buy a house in Stoke-on-Trent. Shouldn't you stand in Stoke-on-Trent Central again? There'd uh, be so many people there disappointed if you don't. Uh, well, look, uh, as I say, I'm going to announce tomorrow where I'm going to stand at this election. We have a fantastic branch in Stoke-on-Trent Central, and they will be out campaigning, and there will be a candidate there at this election, but I'm not prepared to say whether it will or not be me. One problem with Stoke could be the current police inquiry into whether he broke election law by claiming on his nomination form he lived at this house in Stoke, a house he admitted he'd never visited. So instead, it looks like Hartlepool, which Mr Nuttall is due to visit tomorrow. I don't think they would get in, because uh, this is a Labour town, and it's been Labour since 1956. I'm born in UK. Labour is at it. You know, the policies lately from Labour are terrible. I've never heard of Paul Nuttall, <laughs> so I'm not really sure. As far as I'm concerned, the guy's a legend. And Hartlepool could be UKIP's best bet. In 2015, they were only 3,000 votes behind Labour, whose sitting MP is standing down. Michael Craig. UKIP's election campaign launch today didn't go according to plan as far as the party was concerned. Protesters tried to disrupt proceedings, accusing the party of racism. They were eventually removed, allowing the party leader Paul Nuttall to focus on Brexit. But questions over why the party's standing aside in some seats and even why it's standing at all post-Brexit threatened to overshadow proceedings. UKIP wanted to kick off its election campaign, but it kicked off before it had even started. UKIP are a nasty racist party. A small yeah. group of protesters got inside the room. God! You don't have to push me, mate. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm going, mate. I'm going. Are you doing? Yeah, I'm going. It's 
Islamophobic. They kick you are kicking. UKIP leader Paul Nuttall denies his party is Islamophobic or racist, or for that matter, irrelevant. If it wasn't for UKIP, there would have been no referendum in the first place. Brexit has been a long battle. Indeed, some UKIP staff appear to be showing the strain. Is UKIP's war over? The question many voters will have is quite simple. It's what is UKIP for now? We will have a commitment to ensure that Brexit really does mean Brexit. You know, not a soft Brexit, the kind of Brexit people voted for on June the 23rd, which is control of borders, control of money, uh, which is signing our own trade deals right across the globe and bringing democracy back to this country. You're not going to be standing in as many seats as 2015. Why is that? Any reports that you've read that UKIP is only going to stand in 100 seats or some, like, something like that is complete and utter nonsense. We'll be standing in the vast majority of the country. There'll be seats where we will stand aside. So you're actively telling your supporters to vote for another party? Well, in certain seats, isn't that wonderful? That you've got a party leader who's prepared to put country above party. I just wonder what message that sends, though. Well, it sends uh, that we want to ensure that people get the Brexit. Yes, but you're, the to... message hang you're on, sending is don't on, vote hang UKIP, on, hang on. vote for another party. These will, be, these will be seats, OK, which will be marginals, whereby you have a Brexit MP sitting on a slender majority. Paul Nuttall is now hoping for his own majority. He says he will stand in this election but won't say where until tomorrow. He's due to be in Hartlepool in the morning, which could be a massive clue. So what do voters there think? I think maybe if it was Nigel Farage, he might uh, stand a better chance. It'd be close for Labour. <laughs> Why not here? Why not? Yes, they may stand a chance targeting Brexit heartlands like Hartlepool. In 2015, UKIP attracted four million voters. This time they'll need to prove they're not a washed-up political force. So, Angus, that's a week done, but what a weekend coming up, not just Hartlepool. There's only 40 days to go, Alistair. You can almost hear the battle buses revving up. The ground war, as it's called, is going to start soon. Theresa May up in Scotland this weekend. Not fruitful territory for the Tories by any means. But as with Wales, her visit to Wales, you perhaps get the sense that she's trying to show us the scale of her ambitions. Tough battles up there against the SNP and Labour. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader in London this weekend, trying to get younger voters to register and come out. And broadly speaking, if there is a big turnout of young voters, that tends to favour Labour. So a busy weekend ahead. Indeed so. Angus, thank you. Now, a vote for the Conservatives will let Scotland flourish, Theresa May told supporters today on her first campaign appearance north of the border. Labour's Jeremy Corbyn made an appeal to young people, urging them to step up and register to vote. Paul McNamara reports. If a single day could tell the story of this election, today might be it. A buoyant Prime Minister in Scotland, confident of adding to a single MP there. Jeremy Corbyn appealing for youth voters in a safe Labour seat near his London home. The Lib Dems in a university area vying to become the official opposition. And the UKIP leader finally picking a seat to stand in, you guessed it, a Brexit heartland. <laughs> Last election, the Tories were one MP away from obliteration north of the border. Today, Theresa May was in Scotland telling voters if you want to keep the United Kingdom or well, United, vote Conservative. My message to the people of Scotland is clear. Every vote for me and my team will strengthen my hand in the Brexit negotiations. That will, that will strengthen the union, strengthen the economy, and the UK and Scotland together will flourish. Because if Scotland is flourishing, the rest of the United Kingdom is flourishing too. The SNP message is even simpler. We don't want the union, they say, and Scottish voters shouldn't want the Conservatives. But youth is the focus of the day for Labour. Jeremy Corbyn making a call to arms to young voters. Over 2.4 million, let me say that figure again, 2.4 million young people are missing from Britain's electoral register. Barely 40% of 18 to 24-year-olds normally turn out to vote. 
The Conservatives are more than happy with this state of affairs. Apathy and resignation will secure them seats on election day. But is that message making its way to its intended audience? I think it's a big thing that young people vote, especially with uni fees and things like that. I think they could definitely be very impactful when it comes to the election, yeah. I really, really want to be able to vote Labour, but I just can't. The way, not? The way he caved in on Brexit, that's, I just can't. This is really important, Lib Dem Labour marginal here. And I voted Labour last time, but I just can't. I really, will, you be, will you be voting Lib Dem this time then? Yes. I've made up my mind. Formerly Labour, but not Tory, voters like that are the target for this man. Tim Farron was in Leeds today with a bold mission statement for a man with just nine MPs. I think you're saying, let's be honest about it. Well, come on, you've really got a chance of being in opposition? You've only got a handful of MPs. Isn't it? I mean, it's a great soundbite, but in reality, there's no chance, is there? I mean, the great threat to our democracy, and indeed the great threat to all of our public services wherever we live in this country, is that you have a Conservative government that doesn't just win, but wins with an absolute landslide and can take all, us for, all of us for granted. Given that the Labour Party are basically out of the picture now under Jeremy Corbyn, anybody who thinks that colossal Conservative landslide is something that is dangerous to their communities, because they know they'll be taken for granted, only has one option. And the Liberal Democrats just say, it's not a case of it being an opportunity for us, it's a duty for us. Britain needs a strong, decent opposition, I'm determined to be it. Well, the message has gone down very well with this crowd, but the truth of the matter is, if Tim Farron wants to become the official opposition, he needs voters in their droves, especially young voters. The voters Jeremy Corbyn has taken aim at. The problem he has is that many of those voters have very fresh memories of the Lib Dems rolling over on tuition fees. Tim Farron reckons that he's got a chance of the Lib Dems becoming the main opposition in this party, but he's going to need your vote to do it. Yeah, well, after the Lib Dem sided with the Tories to increase the uh, university fees, I'm not really for them at the moment, so yeah. This morning, the leader of Brexit's most bombastic backers, UKIP, finally announced where he will stand to be elected, Boston and Skegness, the constituency with the highest leave vote in the UK. After four failed election bids, Paul Nuttall is hoping if he can finally get elected anywhere, it's here. I've been